Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're having a good day. Today, this episode, we're starting out on the cobblestone generator that we built in the last episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this design. It's been running a little bit in the background. I've done a little bit more cobblestone mining, but it's just there as a fun example of what we can do without damaging the terrain too much. We're actually not going to be spending much time over here at this farming district at all. I just wanted to briefly pop over to the storage system to explain something that happened in the comments of Wednesday's episode because a lot of people were a bit confused about the filtering system and why I didn't put more filter material in there to limit the amount of items stored elsewhere in the system and there is a very good reason for that which we're going to start off this episode by hopping into a creative world so I can explain a little bit easier. So here we are in my creative test world where I do a little bit of behind the scenes work for some of my series and I thought I would use this as a chance to give you guys a bit of an explanation about what's going on with the item filters that I installed in that episode because a lot of people are a little bit confused about why I didn't put more filter material into the system when dealing with bulk storage like this. So let me give you a very quick rundown of what's happening here. If I put some gravel into this, we're going to use gravel and diamond blocks because they look completely different to each other and because having 64 diamond blocks in your inventory is always a bit of fun. So we're going to filter that down until it's got 41 gravel in it and this comparison out the back here is giving off a signal strength of three. So the redstone signal only reaches this block here and doesn't reach that block there. And that is what ends up basically preventing the contents of this hopper from overflowing. This is the hopper where we're going to be filtering through our diamond blocks as an example, right? So most of the time, this would not be a problem to add more filter material to because as people have pointed out, the more filter material we put in here, the more stuff we end up shuttling through this hopper until we end up with a ton more materials in this chest. But the problem comes when this chest starts to fill up with gravel. See, this hasn't affected the hopper on this side yet. And if we add a little bit more filter material in here, up to 11 blocks in each space here, you'll end up with just one gravel left in the system and it hasn't affected this hopper at all. The problem comes when this hopper here starts to fill up with more gravel. Because say, for example, that we add stacks of 64 to every slot in this hopper and then we end up with another 64 gravel filtering into the system. The gravel doesn't have anywhere else to go because it's being fed along a hopper feed line like so and it falls into this item filter. Now the problem is with there being 11 items in each slot here an additional stack in fact anywhere over about 25 items I think should do it if we put 26 there we go You'll notice this is now the comparator giving off a signal strength of four and it's activating the circuit next door, which means all of our items are going to drain out of this hopper. So normally speaking, if you've got a hopper feed line kind of directing gravel into this chest, for the most part, unless this system completely fills up, it's not gonna be an issue. But when the system does completely fill up, you risk basically ruining the storage cells to either side of it because that overflow problem is going to happen. It's gonna activate the redstone torches to either side of it causing all of this to overflow and for all of the items to end up in the chest ruins your item filters and then whatever comes into this hopper here won't be filtered anymore so you'll just get all of the other junk that's going into your storage system ending up in this chest. I hope that makes sense. I hope that kind of clarifies things for you because I did get a few comments on that episode kind of wondering exactly why that happened and maybe I didn't explain it super well in the episode why you only needed one uh, filter material item in each of these slots but hopefully that kind of clarifies things. Okay, back to the episode. And if you're thinking, well, that's unlikely to happen in a survival world where you're just gathering resources, it's already happened to me. I've actually collected enough gravel to completely backfill the system because of the amount of gravel that's around here and the amount of it I'm storing in these chests. Two double chests of gravel plus the inventory of several hoppers was apparently not enough. And any more gravel I put in the system has started to filter into the overflow chest here. But that at least has meant that the overflow chest chest is receiving it and it's not completely draining and messing up the item filters to the circuits to either side. I've actually started keeping some of the gravel in this chest above because you can't really craft a huge amount of stuff out of gravel so it sort of makes sense to keep it all in there and we're going to pop that in the chest from now for now on but I think yeah I think it's probably best if we keep the filters kind of the 
overflow protected way for now because I'm absent minded. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll chuck stuff in here, not noticing the level of items I already have in the chest. And before I know it, the entire filter system, or at least this little section of the filter system could be completely messed up. And I don't really want that to happen. So that explains it. Now, if we have uh, cells like this, where they are all stored, you know, a couple of a couple of blocks apart, if there's at least one block gap, so the redstone doesn't cross over and interfere, then yeah, it is absolutely fine to include enough filter material to only leave one item in the hopper, and that's what we've done with these systems over here. But for this bulk storage system, where the cells are all side by side, it's kind of an essential thing. But yeah, just wanted to clear that up, because I got a lot of comments from people asking, can't you just stuff more filter uh, filter material in there? The other thing that involves, by the way, is just renaming a bunch of items, which can, if you're working on a larger storage system, it can really drain your levels. And right now, without any kind of really good, solid, automated XP farm, I'm actually <laughs> having a hard time getting hold of levels regularly, and I haven't really been able to repair my tools all that well. The last trip to the end meant that I repaired my mending shovel a little bit, but uh, it's not quite been good enough. So one of the priorities for the near future is definitely to get a decent XP farm up and running. But today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to be heading out on one of our exploration journeys, and I'm actually not going to sleep through the night for once, because I want to see if we can demonstrate something while I'm there. But today, we are going to head out on a flight, and we are going to find a mushroom island. Now, I think a great place to start for that is going to be over at the Ocean Monument nether portal that we've established previously, because it is pretty far north on our world. It's actually quite close to where the Ocean Monument is, and so if I can remember where the portal is over here in the nether, we should be able to head over there. I think it's right behind this ridge of netherrack. Believe it or not, I'm actually getting quite good at navigating around this nether just by landmarks. There it is. Perfect stuff. Yeah, we are still going to create a bridge out to this at some point, but I'm working on that. I think it's probably best to save a lot of the stone that I was using for the nether hub design here for some of our builds in the overworld, because I'm not using the nether quite as much. But here we are. I may as well take this bed with me just in case we need it. But we are headed out to the coordinates uh, minus 970, which is pretty close by, and 2020, which is also not too far away from here. So this would be a good jumping on point for looking for this mushroom island. And I've also brought some obsidian and a flint and steel with me, so we can establish a nether portal connection there if we want to. But 500 blocks in one direction and a couple of hundred in the other, it shouldn't take too long to find this place. And here it is coming into view right now, ladies and gentlemen. This is a mushroom island, one of the most unique biomes in all of Minecraft, and it's one of my favorites, actually. I really enjoy a mushroom island. <laughs> so this is actually, mushroom islands are actually called mushroom plains now, or mushroom fields, and there's a good reason for that. It's because they're not always islands. Sometimes they will actually generate connected to landmass, but the main thing about mushroom islands, where they generate, is that you will always find them next to a deep ocean biome. They're, they're always kind of in the middle of an ocean, generally speaking. It's just that sometimes other biomes, and they're in the middle of an ocean as well, and they tend to connect a little bit. But mushroom islands, as the name suggests, are covered with giant mushrooms and regular mushrooms, which will grow freely on this substance here. This is mycelium, <laughs> and this is kind of a variant of dirt in the same way that grass or Podzol are a variant of dirt. We'll get more into the mechanics of mycelium in a moment, but for now, let me also introduce these guys. These are mushrooms, <laughs> which is a great pun, and also, these guys are a variant of cows. They can't breed with cows, they are their own distinct mob, but they are these kind of red cows with mushrooms growing on their backs, and I think, personally, that they're kind of adorable. But the idea about these guys is that they are supposed to be kind of infected with these mushrooms that grow on their backs, and here's a fun fact, if you brought some shears with you, and you right click them with shears, you can actually turn them back into a regular cow and get a few red mushrooms for your trouble. Now you might be thinking, if a regular cow gives me milk, what does a mushroom get me? Good question. Let me open up a crafting table, craft some planks, and we'll craft a few wooden bowls, because instead of buckets, these guys need wooden bowls for you to milk them, because they don't actually give you milk at all. If you right click on one of these guys with a wooden bowl, they give you mushroom stew, which is a non-stackable item. Stew in Minecraft doesn't let you stack it, presumably because it would get kind of sloppy with all of the bowls <laughs> stuck on each other, but you end up with a lot of individual mushroom stew, and that can actually be 
a really nice food source if you decide to set up a base here on a mushroom island. Now this is kind of an unusual site right here. We've seen a couple of endermen walking around. The fun thing about mushroom islands is that mobs don't naturally spawn in a mushroom island biome. And it may be that because we are the only thing around, like we're the only player on this world and because like there's no other areas loaded to spawn in mobs, they might have actually spawned on these grass blocks here because where you see grass blocks, that's actually the start of an ocean biome that is generated kind of sloping up into this mushroom fields. But the majority of the mushroom biome, like anything that's marked mushroom fields or mushroom fields shore, when you press F3, will not be affected by the usual mob spawning rules. It can be as dark as you want here, and in fact it is completely nighttime right now, and you'll notice that no other hostile mobs are spawning on this island. There's no creepers, there's no zombies, skeletons, witches, and so forth. None of that exists. And I think the main reason these endermen are running around so much is because they are capable of teleporting, so they can just kind of wander around anywhere they want to, really. The fact that there are no mob spawns on these islands actually makes them a really great place to start a base if you can find one and if you're keen on not having any mobs be part of your world because you don't need to worry too much about lighting you don't need to worry about monsters coming out at night you can just relax and build here if you want to if you can put up with the strange plants being everywhere because you won't find trees or anything like that on a mushroom island unless you get lucky and one of the ocean biomes over there has generated a tree but I'm fairly certain ocean biomes don't even generate trees even if they start to slope up onto land like this so you're probably going to have to bring some saplings of your own if you want to uh, make one of these your base. Now the fun thing about mycelium is that it will spread to dirt in much the same way grass does, meaning that if we take a few blocks of mycelium back with us using our silk touch shovel, we can actually grow this in greater supply at our base. Why would you want to grow mycelium, you ask? Well, it's actually got some unique properties as far as blocks go that are shared with Podzol in that you can place a mushroom down on it anywhere. Normally, mushrooms need a low light level in order to be planted on grass or anything like that. In fact, if we go over to that grass over here on the other side of the island, I won't be able to place mushrooms on that grass, but you can place it anywhere you like on mycelium. See, check it out. We're right clicking here and I cannot place this mushroom down on the grass, whereas with the mycelium, I can place it absolutely anywhere. And there's no difference between here and here in terms of light level. In fact, even if we put down torches next to the mushrooms here, the mushrooms won't pop off the mycelium where they would if they were growing somewhere with low light on grass or stone or anything like that. An environment where you can put down mushrooms anywhere is actually also a great environment for bone mealing them to grow them into large mushrooms, which you can do pretty easily. After a few shots of bone meal, it grows just like a regular tree. Mushrooms still need quite a large space in which to grow though because they've got quite large caps and so I think they need at least seven by seven blocks around them to be free. However, <laughs> once you grow them, they are actually kind of fun to have around. And if you've got a silk touch tool, you can harvest the cap blocks. The ax is the one that will harvest them the fastest and you can end up building with these things. It's possible to obtain both the cap blocks and the stem blocks as individual blocks using silk touch. And if you place down one of the cap blocks and you place blocks around either side and then take them away, you also get this third texture with the kind of underside spore texture. And that allows you to create some really nice custom mushrooms if you know how. That only works if you place other mushroom blocks adjacent to them though. If I place these planks on here and then remove the planks, that doesn't convert it to the spore texture. It's only connecting mushroom blocks that allows you to do that. Yet another advantage to having mushroom islands as your base is that you can go caving underneath them without worrying about any kind of hostile mobs. <laughs> because anytime you'll go caving down here, as long as you're staying within the boundaries of the mushroom island, nothing is going to spawn. The biome continues all the way to bedrock. So wherever you are in the world, if you're standing at sea level, if you're standing up in the air, if you're standing at like y equals four, like right down at the bottom of the world, you're still going to be in a mushroom fields biome as long as you're directly below the surface island, which allows you to cave without worries, without cares, without even having to worry too much about hostile mobs. Although still make sure that you stay away from lava. Now there are two exceptions to mobs spawning within the boundaries of a mushroom island. One of those is if you find a mob spawner, because if you find a dungeon with a mob spawner in it, the mob spawner is still going to obey its usual 
individual rules. If you get within 16 blocks of it, it's going to start spawning monsters. So if you happen to be caving below a mushroom island biome and you hear zombie noises or skeleton noises and you've checked the F3 screen to make sure that you're still within the boundary of the island because you could have just wandered out into a cave underneath the ocean. If you're still under the island, then chances are you have found yourself a monster spawner. And that's going to get some pretty good spawning rates because there is less chance for hostile mobs to be spawning on the surface at night. They're not going to take up the mob cap. When I say mob cap, by the way, it's a concept I haven't really explored in this series before. There is a limit to the amount of hostile mobs Minecraft can spawn at one time. It's mainly a performance thing. It just so it uh, limits the amount of monsters that appear so it's not like having to process too much information at once for lower end systems to make sure that they can still run the game without crashing. Typically, mob spawners will ignore mechanics like that because once you've moved the monsters out of the range of the spawner, it will just keep spawning more of them. But it's usually a good idea to light up the surface and any nearby caves to make sure that Minecraft isn't having to deal with a bunch of other monsters nearby. Now, the other exception to mob spawning in Mushroom Island biomes is phantoms. And phantoms, since they spawn in the night sky, will spawn regardless of which biome you're in. So if you spend a few nights here at a Mushroom Island, you will still encounter phantoms in much the same way that you would any other biome. The main solution to that, of course, is to spend the night with something above your head. Spend the night in a cave or in a house or underneath one of these convenient mushroom parasols if you want to. That will actually prevent uh, phantoms from spawning if there is a block above your head somewhere. They have to have open sky access to you in order to spawn in the first place. Alternatively, just remember to sleep every couple of nights and you won't have to mess with those if you don't want to. But as with many things, there is a twist to the mob spawning mechanics here, and that is that normal passive mobs, things like regular cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, and so forth, cannot spawn on mycelium. In fact, the only thing that can spawn on mycelium is these mushrooms. Not only that, but mushrooms cannot spawn anywhere except for a mushroom island biome, and they will only be able to spawn on mycelium. So if you were to convert this entire place to grass, which I've actually done a couple of times in the past, because the grass color here is so bright and cartoonishly green that it's actually kind of fun to build in, you still won't be able to spawn any new mushrooms on that grass. It will. They will only be able to spawn on mycelium, which you can actually use to great effect if you want to farm mushrooms, because all you need to do is create an area of land where there is just mycelium and surround the rest of it with grass, and you're always going to get mushroom cows spawning there. So that makes it fairly ideal for creating some kind of automatic farm with these guys. But in the end, one of the things that makes these islands most interesting is the fact that they are relatively rare. You won't find all that many mushroom islands in your world. In fact, I had to use a biome atlas program, I had to use mine atlas in order to find this one in the first place, because they only occur in deep ocean biomes, in large deep oceans, and they don't always occur in every single ocean that you find. This ocean is, thankfully, big enough that I have a few mushroom islands in fairly close proximity. And I think if I went further to the northeast, I would find another mushroom island. And there is another one to the southwest that is connected to a small spit of land. Now we've connected this one to this nether portal. I can just take the coordinates really quick. I will make sure that that's linked up to a separate nether portal in the nether because I have a feeling that one might just connect back to our uh, ocean temple guardian space because that's uh, a little bit kind of close by, I suppose. And this right here is the other example. This is the patch of Mushroom Island that is connected to a forest over here. And aside from those two islands and this one, the next Mushroom Island is, I think, about 6,000 blocks away. So <laughs> it's, it's very, very far from spawn. And chances are that you'll find a Mushroom Island within a few thousand blocks of your spawn point, but unless you have a large enough ocean, it's not always going to be possible. So keep that in mind in future. If you're looking for a mushroom island, you will probably have to struggle a little bit to find one. If you're exploring naturally, expect to do a lot of ocean exploring. And if you're looking for one on Mine Atlas or any other kind of biome finding tool, then expect to find one several thousand blocks away from your base. But this should now hopefully be a nether portal connection to that mushroom island we just established. Perfect, so there we go. Okay, we're all set up here, and we can come here, collect mushrooms, collect mycelium, pretty much whenever we want to. And we might even return here in future to harvest some giant mushrooms, convert some patches of this into grass, or just explore the ocean from where we are. But for now, I think let's head back to base, and I'll show you a couple of more fun things about 
giant mushrooms before we wrap up this episode. Giant mushrooms can be grown anywhere. They don't just have to be grown on a mushroom island. And as long as you have some podzol or some mycelium, it should be nice and easy to grow them anywhere out in the open. Not only that, but harvesting these blocks without silk touch will net you more mushrooms. So if you happen to be running low on mushrooms, but you have one and you want to convert it into a bunch more, this is probably the most time effective way of harvesting some more mushrooms. It is possible to grow mushrooms in dark conditions, if you have an area that has a light level below, I think, 11 or something like that, it should be possible to grow mushrooms, say, in a cave, for example. But in this case, it's a lot faster just to... Yeah, there we go. We've got 16 mushrooms just from one brown mushroom that we planted and a little bit of bone meal. If you've got the bone meal to spare, it's definitely worth your time. And thankfully, in the latest version of Minecraft Java Edition, 2x2 two two spruce trees, when you grow them manually, will generate this area of podzol around them, making acquiring podzol fairly trivial in the early game of Minecraft. Normally, you had to find either a mushroom biome or a mega tiger where podzol generates naturally in order to grow mushrooms just freely wherever you wanted to. Even on stuff like coarse dirt, you won't be able to plant a regular mushroom unless the light level is low enough. And that was the key to growing mushrooms without podzol or mycelium. For a while, the trick was to create a hole like so, pop a water bucket down, and the water bucket would actually create a low enough light level on the block below it that you could plant a mushroom on there. Now, in recent versions, that has been patched, but at least you should be able to get some podzol fairly easily. Alternatively, you just need to create a dark enough environment to be able to place a mushroom in the first place. And if we create a kind of plus shape over the top of this hole like so, it should still be possible to place a mushroom there. And while you've got the mushroom in there, you can probably take away all of the blocks and grow the mushroom in time. But bear in mind that if you do that and then the block next to the mushroom gets updated at all, once the light level has returned to normal, it's gonna pop off straight away because it realizes that this block needs to be updated. So <laughs> that's actually a neat way of growing giant mushrooms without the need for podzol or mycelium at all, which might work for those of you who are playing in older versions of Minecraft Java or maybe even on Bedrock. So let me know Bedrock players if that one works for you or not. But I think that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this. It's been a bit more of an explorey one and we've even brought back a few souvenirs. Let me know if you enjoyed this episode in the comments. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.